Thank you, Medtronic, for inviting me. Uh, I'm not an orthopedic surgeon, I'm a pediatric cardiologist, but I've been trying to create an interface between clinicians and artificial intelligence for over a decade now. And I'm very, very glad to be here today. So thank you, Medtronic, and also uh, shout out to Dr. Afshin Dominion for uh, uh, making the connection. And um, as I look at um, the artificial intelligence use in clinical medicine surgery, I'm very impressed with the spine surgeons to be uh, sort of among the vanguard group of surgeons using artificial intelligence in a very good way. And also uh, not just in the operating room, but uh, in, in terms of using it for patient outcome, which is ultimately our North Star for artificial intelligence. So um, I thought I'd share with you some of my thoughts about what's happening in artificial intelligence with some special references to uh, spine surgery to make it even more relatable and relevant for you. Now I just moved to my second slide. So if you can't see that, uh, okay, I do see it. So I always um, also pay a special tribute to all of our frontline workers, including the orthopedic surgeons and um, in this um, terrible pandemic we're in. If you were to ask me a, an overall grade for artificial intelligence during the pandemic, I would say uh, it's um, a B minus C plus. And um, we need to work on using artificial intelligence for decision support and logistics. But where I think artificial intelligence really shined during this pandemic has been in the area of therapeutics, uh, including the vac vaccine development. So artificial intelligence you may or may not know was a big player in drug repurposing and vaccine development. Um, so I think uh, overall, we still need to work on decision support and data. Now, the terms artificial intelligence, machine learning and deep learning gets thrown around and it's almost interchangeable in the press. But um, artificial intelligence as Marvin Minsky, the computer scientist, so eloquently defined decades ago is simply uh, any technique that um, allows computers to um, do something that requires intelligence by humans. Machine learning is a, is a subset of artificial intelligence that enables computers to learn uh, is sort of a, a really uh, advanced, um, let's see, advanced um, statistics. And um, the difference between machine learning and statistics is that statistics is sort of top down you set the rules and you find the information. And machine learning, it's, it's sort of bottom up. You have data and uh, you learn from the data continuously. And deep learning is a very special kind of machine learning and it's particularly relevant for uh, spine surgery, um, especially with image related um, tasks. And it's a neural net or a brain like uh, version of machine learning. And these have been, uh, we're very lucky to have deep learning at this stage uh, in 2022, um, it's been around for less than 10 years. Um, so artificial intelligence is here, just not evenly distributed. Uh, here is uh, in the operating room, a biopsy of the brain. And you can see that um, instead of sending the specimen um, conventionally to the pathology lab only, this sample is also prepared uh, with an artificial intelligence tool in the operating room so that you can get an interpretation of the image from the biopsy directly in the operating room <clears throat> with a deep learning tool, something called convolutional neural network or CNN, and we'll discuss that in a minute. So you get the results of this um, biopsy uh, image interpretation in 100 seconds rather than the usual 20, 30, 40 minutes from the pathology lab. So it's very, very highly effective, highly accurate. Perhaps uh, we can argue that it's even more accurate than human pathologists looking at the sample. So it, it, this is, has immediate um, ramifications to shorten the OR time and improve patient care. I think this type of use of deep learning in artificial intelligence in the operating room will be very standard of practice by the end of the decade. Now, when I, when I was in school, I was fortunate enough to um, be part of the Stanford program of biomedical data science on artificial intelligence. And as a cardiologist, I've always, uh, and this has relevance to orthopedics and spine surgery as well, I always wonder what it'd be like to marry a, an MRI of the heart with an echocardiogram. 
And um, this is one of my projects when I was in school. And you can actually create an artificial intelligence tool uh, that will tie the two images together. And it's very, very impressive in terms of having this hybrid uh, image. So artificial intelligence is also good as a resource tool to do the impossible or do something that you hadn't thought was possible. Now in spine surgery, uh, just like everything else, um, you've, we've seen this escalation of publications um, uh, more than ever before and um, not much activity until about 2010 and you see in the, in the past few years has really escalated. So um, it's a way to do research in a different way, clinical research. In the future, clinical research will no longer be just randomized controlled trials and chart reviews. It'll be real time, real world evidence, um, um, sort of knowledge discovery. So it's a change in the research paradigm as well. And I'm impressed with the number of articles, particularly review articles in spine surgery, never mind orthopedic surgery. So um, special kudos to all of you that have contributed to that. And these are actually quite good in terms of just getting a very general overview of artificial intelligence and how it relates to spine surgery. So uh, again, um, I think uh, orthopedic surgeons deserve praise and, and spinal, spinal surgery surgeons as well for really uh, adopting to the wonderful resource that we have as, um, as artificial intelligence. Now, there's always a discussion about whether or not it's going to replace doctors and surgeons, well, especially surgeons, because robots won't, and artificial intelligence will not be able to replace you for a long time, at least probably not even in our lifetime. But um, what's really impressive is it's taken on the perception tasks. So if you look at a doctor and surgeon and you divide the brain into three parts, one is perception, so a medical image interpretation and analytics. The computers are doing very well with that. Artificial intelligence can even supersede the human capabilities in that particular area. It doesn't mean you can't do these tasks. It just means that it's going to help us to augment our capabilities. Um, the second part of the brain is cognition. So an example of that is complex decision-making or something that takes creativity. Even very straightforward surgery is going to be very, very difficult for robots and artificial intelligence to do. So um, there's a something called a Marivex paradox, which is anything that's easy for humans may actually in fact be very difficult for artificial intelligence or computers and vice versa. Something that's very easy for artificial intelligence like parallel computation, it does it so quickly and so accurately can be very difficult for humans as well. So you see this um, wonderful potential for synergy between artificial intelligence and, and clinical work um, and um, surgery. So AI should be looked at as an augmentation, but not as a replacement for humans. Um, the common sort of joke in artificial intelligence now is a doctor that knows artificial intelligence uh, can replace a doctor who doesn't. So um, I think that may apply to spine surgery that the future generation of spine surgeons will all be very knowledgeable and very familiar with what artificial intelligence can do. Um, now in the second half to talk, I'm just gonna quickly go over some of the nuances. Um, the hardest part about artificial intelligence projects um, in clinical medicine and surgery is uh, what we have to deal with in terms of healthcare data. And healthcare data is very fragmented. Um, there's, so if we have ways to get around the uh, healthcare data conundrum, then I think we'll go a long way. So as the political saying um, sort of um, inspired me to say, it's the data stupid. So artificial intelligence is very robust. All the uh, methodologies are quite mature. It's the healthcare data that is the challenge. So uh, that's where surgeons and clinicians can help is you can organize data. I mentioned convolutional neural network. This is um, the brain's uh, the computer's way of mimicking the brain's visual cortex is a very elegant way of interpreting any image. So the computer sees images as numbers, and we have a system that can do um, these processes to basically mimic the human uh, visual cortex. Very impressive results. Uh, again, um, artificial intelligence now can be better than groups of image-related subspecialists 
like radiologists will get images. And it's just been a Cambrian explosion of artificial intelligence um, CNN tools to look at medical images. It's a very, very exciting era right now in looking at medical images. So in the future, in the near future, you will see uh, computer-backed uh, artificial intelligence-enabled medical image interpretation being routine. Part of, the, part of the issue is there's so many medical images now that are being generated that humans cannot keep up with all that work. And uh, on the right there is actually a wonderful article that was using uh, deep learning to look at um, fresh um, osteoporotic vertebral fractures on MRI. So uh, no longer do human radiologists and spine surgeons need to always be the ones that are looking at images. You can get help from artificial intelligence. A couple of methodologies are particularly useful just to put in your AI vocabulary. One is um, this um, something called transfer learning, which is one way of uh, spreading medical image interpretation knowledge and capability very quickly amongst um, AI tools. Um, so that's called transfer learning. Another one is called generative adversarial network or GANs. So when you hear in the news about fake news or fake images or fake videos, this is how it's done. It's using a technique that enables a generation of a uh, duplicate. And this is how you can get more uh, data in healthcare for computers to learn from. And I think we're heading into the wonderful world of precision medicine where um, AI image interpretation, along with very many other omics, genomics, uh, microbiomics, and everything else. So spine surgery in the future, your risk profiling, for instance, will not just be obviously the type of surgery, but also the risk profile based on the patient's genetics and family history and everything else. So it's going to be more complicated, but in a way much better for our patients. So precision medicine. And this is a, a nice uh, uh, sort of a diagram of showing that it's not just only the um, intraoperative part where AI can be helping uh, spine surgery. It's the many, many um, types of data coming in to um, basically give you a much clearer picture of the risk and the um, post-op care for patients. So it's not just intraoperative, which is the most obvious use of AI, but it's also um, sort of um, looking at how you can help patients overall. And um, so basically we're going from the, the era of evidence-based medicine. And so for the surgeons to really um, enable precision diagnosis and therapy, intraoperative decision support as well as disease management, this information knowledge gap is gonna be tremendous for humans to try to overcome. So we're going to be in the era of what I call intelligence-based medicine or surgery, uh, allowing the computers and AI to help. And um, if you didn't follow that graph, this is an easier way of looking at how evidence-based medicine is just the tip of the iceberg. What we really need is to look at what's underneath the surface. And that's a tremendous amount of data information that we're not using. So look at artificial intelligence as a resource not as just a specific tool for images, but as a resource to help throughout the entire health system, uh, including administrative aspects. And this is uh, thanks to my uh, good friend who is a pediatric surgeon, how uh, I think AI will be um, a big part of real-time deep learning and perhaps also mentoring. The scope is in the perfect place. I think it's best to make your incision right here. Here is the minor fissure. Here is the front of the major fissure. I would start right here and unroof the cyst. Follow this plane right here. The superior segment artery should be near there. Now, since um, Todd made this video, we do have now real-time deep learning to help with procedures in several subspecialties already. So uh, it's become reality. Now, the future of artificial intelligence, um, conveniently put it in alphabetized form, A is for augmented and extended reality. So if you add AI to this, it's going to be what we call intelligent reality. And I'm actually working on a project in that area. Um, B is for um, biomedicine. Um, it's, it's amazing the therapeutics that are, going, that are going to be coming in this, gen, in this um, decade 
because AI enabled um, biomolecular um, um, imaging and therapeutics. Uh, C is for cognition and natural, natural language processing. Um, natural language processing is going to be a deal maker in terms of looking at all the records in electronic records and understand what humans are saying. That's a way for computers to figure out what we're talking about. Uh, D is for digital biomarkers. And for your post-op patients, for instance, um, more and more wearable technology will give us more and more data, but data needs to be analyzed with artificial intelligence. And it's going to be multimodal. So that's the exciting thing about um, all of this to follow your patients post-operatively. Um, e is for embedded AI. So these devices will actually have AI embedded within the device. So that's exciting also. And that's already being done at MIT. They have a artificial intelligence embedded in a tiny microprocessor. So the era of wearable technology that's intelligent is already here. Um, I think F is for federated learning or collective intelligence. If you haven't heard of this term, it's basically uh, learning together without sharing data. Data sharing has been a, a, a sort of um, um, blocking some of the efforts to look at uh, AI projects. And I think um, federated and swarm learning is going to be a wonderful way to uh, minimize the hassle of data sharing. And G is for Gemini or virtual twin. So in the future, you'll be able to do uh, sort of a, um, a surgery on your patient, but not in the operating room. You'll be doing it virtually to see what the nuances might be. And it's the concept of a virtual health twin so that you can uh, do a procedure. And this is um, already being practiced. This is um, uh, pediatric cardiologist in my group looking at an MRI this is, um, this is an, this is an and um, trying to implant a device before we actually do it in the patients. No, no, this, so, um, this, is, this is all mostly uh, uh, deep learning and analytics enabled. So if you're um, more curious about artificial intelligence, we know you're all very busy. So uh, we have a a uh, one and a half day crash course um, under the American Board of AI Medicine that I'm proud to chair. So you can, as a clinic, we've had orthopedic surgeon come through and a day and a half, you can kind of learn all the vocabulary and the concepts of artificial intelligence and um, quite impressive in terms of how much you learn in, in a day and a half. And this is backed by a very big advisory group. Um, all the institutions that you are familiar with in this space of artificial intelligence and um, also, I'm the privileged editor of a book called Intelligence-Based Medicine. We are working on intelligence-based surgery as a book. Um, the next book is in cardiology. And there's also a journal that has um, uh, articles that are very relevant to surgery as well. And um, also, we have a meeting coming up uh, in a few months in person, um, May 24th and 26th at the Western St. Francis in San Francisco. It's going to be... Um, three or four days of uh, action-packed program in artificial intelligence, including aspects of surgery. So um, please join us there. We typically have about uh, five to 700 clinicians and AI experts talk about the newest and the greatest uh, in artificial intelligence. So with that, I wanna thank um, my institute that is focused on artificial intelligence called the Medical Intelligence Innovation Institute at Children's Hospital Orange County, and my wonderful uh, colleagues and mentors at Stanford School of Medicine in the Biomedical Data Science and AI program. So thank you very much. And here's my contact information, including my cell phone, um, in case you're interested in contacting me. I love hearing from all cell specialists for, with an interest in artificial intelligence. Again, Medtronic and Dr. Minion, thank you very much for the invitation. And I'll be uh, at the panel uh, for the Q&A later this morning.